Good morning. If y'all want to leave the lights off or y'all want to turn them on? It's up to you. Turn them on. Jack, can you turn those lights on? That was my job this morning. Ned's on vacation and I forgot, so get what you pay for on the soundboard, let me tell you. With me, I don't do well on that. <laughs> Good to see y'all this morning. Glad you're here. Welcome. We're going to continue our study this morning in 1 John chapter 3. So if you'll open your Bibles to, we're going to begin, I think, in verse 4 this morning. Our title this morning is No Condemnation for the Children of God. That says a lot. It speaks volumes. No condemnation for the children of God. Father, we ask that you open our ears this morning, speak to our hearts. We pray that you will just touch us and draw us closer to you. May your spirit just bring us into your word. Expose the things within us, Lord, that that you want to cut out and open our hearts to receive all that you have for us. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for you. And we ask this morning that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we saw that, that we are the children and heirs of God, which shines a clear light on the fact that this is all about a relationship, not about religion. And it's also clear that only through Jesus do we have access to this inheritance. There are many false beliefs out there. There are many different things out there that will tell you many things. But if Jesus is not the way, if that's not the preaching or the teaching, then they're in error. And we have to make sure that we understand that. John 14, 6 said, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this statement that Jesus made does not leave any room for misunderstanding. <laughs> it's, it's very clear. It's, it's, it's a very truthful, hard line drawn statement. There's no other door. There's no other way to get to, G to, get to the Father, to get to heaven. And Jesus was the only one that was worthy to become the sacrificial lamb to take away the sin of the world. And then to sit at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. His blood paid the price for us to be reconciled back to the Father, restoring the relationship with God that was broken when Adam fell in the garden. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. And Romans 8, 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now this, again, is a hard truth for some, because some won't accept the coexist bumper sticker, and they want everybody to be all, all okay with everybody else's beliefs. But the problem with that is, is that if you start welcoming in everyone else's beliefs into yours, then you really don't believe what you say you believe. You're calling Jesus a liar if you say, well, there are other ways. Because he said there is no other way. So you can't mix Christianity with other belief systems. All the other religions are lies, and they come from the father of lies, which is Satan. You can't accept other religions as truth, again, unless you're calling Jesus a liar. So all the other religions may coexist together. They can have their bumper sticker. Because they're all leading to the same place. And that's, it's, again, it's a very hard truth, but this is the, the, the actual truth of it, is, is that if you don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter what other religion you're in, you can all coexist because you'll wind up at the same place. But you won't wind up with the Father. You won't wind up in heaven. Matthew 13, 41 through 43 says, The Son of Man will send... Out his aim, they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, when you really start getting into the word, if you believe what Jesus said, if you believe the word of God, then you have to draw a line. There is no black and white. It's Jesus or nothing. That's it. If you don't have Jesus, you may have the world, but the world's going to burn. 
You may have an eternity, but it's going to be eternity separated from God in a place called hell because it does exist. So we have to come to this point to where we're willing. And in this culture, it's hard because in this culture, we have everybody coming against a hard truth. They want it to be anything they want it to be. They want to write their own truth. And that's the culture we live in. Oh, that may be your truth, but I have my truth. No, if you don't have Jesus, you have a lie. And that's a hard thing to say, but you have to come to the point where you're bold and ask God to give you the boldness to say and stand on these things. And I'm not saying you go out and take the Bible and beat people over the head with it. What I'm saying is be, be prepared in season and out of season to preach the Word. And the Word says Jesus is the way. So, Jesus is the way. There is no other. And it's okay to say that. I know that you'll get, like, like, you know, people will come against you. You may have people come and protest the church. You may have people, the media may show up because they're all in the same pit with the rest of them. But when you're actually standing in truth, you don't have to defend God's Word. His Word defends itself. And we can stand upon His Word. Don't be deceived. Jesus is the only way. Now this week, John tells us about the sin and the child of God. Tells us about sin in general and the child of God. So let's pick up in verse 4 of 1 John chapter 3. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sin. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither been seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he's been born of God. Now, if you're a young believer, or maybe you're not a believer at all, but you've heard about Jesus and these things, and you happen to read these passages, you have to dig deep in here. This, on the surface, this can be confusing to a lot of people. And people with a legalistic mind will grab a hold of that and say, oh, well, then you're not in Jesus at all if you ever sin after you're saved. You can't have any sin. It says, you cannot sin. Well, let's dive into that. And let's see what this really means. There are two Greek words for sin used in verses 4 through 9. And the first Greek word is harmatia, hamatia. It means an offense or sinful in practice. Now, the Greek word for commit, when it says commit sin, in verse 4, is poiohio. That means continue, deal without any delay, execute, exercise, keep, or lay in wait. So in context, what John is saying here is that he who habitually sins or, con or continues to live a lifestyle of sin commits lawlessness or an offense against God. This mindset is from the devil. And this person has settled in his heart that he can live a lifestyle that goes against God's word and he's okay. This is the mindset of the world or of those who actually may claim to be a believer or a Christian but don't understand what the word of God says and do not actually have never accepted Jesus in relationship so they still think, well, I prayed a prayer, so therefore I'm, I'm going to be saved from hell. I can live any way I want to. And that's my truth. But that goes against God's Word. Anyone who denies the truth of God's Word in any area of their life, they're bringing judgment upon themselves because His Word will be the judge. John 12, 46 through 48 says, I have come the light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So Jesus didn't come to judge. 
the first time. He didn't come as judge. He came to save the world. He came to offer himself as a living sacrifice. On that cross, he offered himself, take our sins upon himself. He died. Then he rose again, ascended to the Father, intercedes for those who are his. And so the word itself, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is what will bring condemnation to those who do not receive it in this lifetime. And that's what we have to understand. If we stand on the truth of God's word and we believe it and we're bold about it, again, not aggressively beating people up with it, but bold where we stand to say, no, this is what the Bible says. That does not bring judgment, or we don't bring judgment. If they do not receive the word that was given, that itself will bring judgment in the last day. God's word is true. His word will live forever. And so, therefore, we have to come to this point of understanding that, that you have this lifetime to accept him. You have this lifetime to receive him and walk in him and be in relationship with him. And after we take that last breath, that, that offer is off the table. Now you face judgment by his word. Now the second word, or the second Greek word that is used in these verses is harmartano, hamartano. I'm on the right page here. And it means to miss the mark or not share in the prize, to err, uh, especially morally err or to sin, offend, sin, and trespass. So when John, John uses this word, he's saying that only non-believers can miss the mark. Only those who have not accepted the truth and been born again uh, will bring the offense or the transgression. And this is the word that he uses in verse 8 when he speaks of Satan. It says in verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And again, the word sin there is specifically saying he is the one who's bringing the transgression He's never going to receive Jesus. He's going to be walking in darkness. He's the father of lies. And those who do not receive Jesus, like Satan, this is the word for sin that they're talking about. Again, it's the habitual sin, unrepented habitual sin, that every non-believer is in bondage to. And I want to make that clear. Every non-believer is in bondage to sin. A believer cannot be in bondage to sin. Jesus has delivered us from the law of sin and death. So we're not in bondage to it any longer. Now, when we're born again, the sin that uh, brought this offense or transgression was atoned for. It's dealt with on the cross. And we're no longer bound by that. Romans 8, 1 through 3. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Only Jesus could do that. He condemned sin because He was sinless. And He was the only one that was. And so therefore, when he came, he did what we could not do for ourselves. And he condemned that sin in us. <clears throat> the work of Jesus on the cross accomplished this for us. And this was God's plan. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. And over and over, that's what he would say. I came to do the will of my Father. And what he says I do, I do. That's the attitude that Jesus had. When he, came from the very, when he came as a baby, was born and raised up, he was sinless because he came to do the will of the Father. His call on his fleshly life, human life, was to be the sacrificial lamb. And that's what he came to do. And this work that he accomplished for us is a done deal. Now God's word reveals this sin to us and exposes it, and we repent. See, this is, the, this is where we come into the relationship. We have to see what sin is. We have to receive the fact that we are sinners. And then we have to accept the fact that only Jesus can deliver us from those sins. And then we can be set free from the law of sin and death. And the Word of God, as I said earlier, it speaks truth. 
And the word of God, if you receive it, it will not judge you. If you reject it, it will be your judge. But Hebrews 4.12 gives us this insight regarding the word. It says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is how powerful the Word of God is. The Word of God exposes sin. The Word of God shows us who we are in Christ or who we are without Christ. The conviction is then given, and we have the choice to repent, accept Jesus, repent, and turn from that, and then He makes us new. He gives us a new life. Notice the wording here. It exposes the thoughts and intents of the heart. We don't even know half the time what the intent of our heart is. Many times we have to be awakened to it and it's, it, through conflicts and through different things. You're exposed. It, it'll expose who you are. And once you see that, it's not an easy thing to see. It's a hard thing to see. But once you see it, you have a choice. Am I going to continue in it now that it's been exposed or am I going to repent from it? Am I going to receive what Jesus has and allow this in my life to die? That's the choice that each one has. That's the one that, we, one that we continue to have. And so for the believer, our thoughts and intents change from the old man to the new. Now let me say that this is a process. This is a process. There are many, and we've all heard testimonies, that they, they received Jesus and they were instantly delivered from drugs. Instantly delivered from alcohol or habitual uh, habits or whatever it might be. And that's wonderful when you hear those testimonies, but I want to make this very clear. There's still other areas in their life that they're going to be dealing with that God is going to continue to expose in their life and they're going to continue to grow closer to Him. Okay, they got, got this big one. <laughs> Here's the big one. We got that one, but now we got the life. We got the rest of our life to live. And He's going to continue through the Word to expose things in your life that He wants you to, to, to remove. He wants to remove them from you. And so when you're, when you're walking this, you have to abide in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is Christ Jesus, He's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, in the spirit realm, this is accomplished. This is done. We are... In a relationship with Jesus, we're abiding in Him. And so in this relationship, He continues to bring things to us. We continue to, be, uh, to respond to it. We repent, and He moves us to the next one. It's a growing process. You go, you're an infant when you receive Jesus. Then you get more maturity as you go and grow and grow in His Word. And then when you get up in, in, in maturity of, of spiritual age, not necessarily chronologi chronological age, because people, a lot of times there's some baby Christians at 80 years old. So it's a matter of growing closer to Him. That's the spiritual, spiritual age that we're talking about. Now, as a new man, the Holy Spirit brings conviction, conviction when we're tempted by sin. That's the new creation. There's now a spirit awakening See, when he says we're born again, what that means is the spirit that is laid dormant because of sin has now been awakened to the Spirit of God. And now that we're awakened to the Spirit of God, he brings us the conviction. The Holy Spirit brings the conviction. Where before we lived any way we wanted to, it was, not, you know, it was no big deal. You didn't care. This is who I am. And in some cases, non-believers will say, this is how God made me. No, God didn't make you this way. Sin made you this way. Because His Word says this. So therefore, let's abide in Him, and, we cannot, and then we're exposed. When that happens, this conviction of the Holy Spirit comes when we're tempted. Now we know that the offense we were once in bondage to no longer has a hold on us, because this is what we just read, what John is telling us. So we no longer practice habitual sin. And this is what John means when he says a child of God cannot sin. It's a habitual, continual, I'm okay in what I'm doing, sin. 
That's what he's saying here. You can't do that and be a, Christ, be a Christian. You can't live in Christ, abide in Christ, and say that your sinful life is okay. Can't do it. And that's what he says. That a Christian who is a believer cannot live that way. Now, with that said, I want to make a point here that Christians can fall into sin. There's a difference. When a Christian falls to a temptation, there's still conviction. There's still the, the response that we have of repentance because when we fall into sin, we know it's sin. And the Spirit brings this conviction of that sin, and that conviction then leads to repentance. And these are not bound under, or back under, should I say, the penalty of the law of sin and death. Because we can't live there as a believer and abiding in Christ. You can't. They, you can't house both of those things. The whole reason Jesus came is because we couldn't fix ourselves. Our sin was there. We're born into it. Because of the fall of man, everyone born after Adam and Eve are born into sin. They have a sinful nature. We can't fix that. And while we're in this earthly tent, we still battle that fleshly nature. Paul says that the spirit wrestles against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. And we're going to battle this. But we have the spirit of God who dwells in us that fights against this flesh. It fights the battle for us when we're abiding in Christ and we're submitted to Him. But we have to walk in the Spirit, which is what abiding is. Walking in the Spirit of God is what it means to abide in Christ. Galatians 5, 16-18, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. What is that law? The law of sin and death. You're no longer under that when you're abiding in Christ and you're walking in the Spirit. Now, that's wonderful news. That's exciting for us to know that we are in Christ even though we are tempted and sometimes we may fall, we're still in Christ, we still repent, we're still restored. We're not under that law of sin and death any longer. But that doesn't give us now this freedom to live any way we want to. And this is where we have to really come to that understanding that, okay, if I'm a believer, if I'm abiding in Christ, if I stumble into sin, I can't stay there. I can't come to this point and say, well, now that I'm saved and, and I, I know that He's in me and I have all of this that, that God's doing for me, I, I, I'm okay if I do this. And, he, he, and I'm struggling with it, so it's got to be okay. No, that's not where we come to. We can't come to that point. It doesn't give, the, give us this freedom to continue in sin. Romans chapter 6 gives us very clear understanding of this. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. Because it, I, I tried to find certain scriptures to pull out, but they're all too good. So we're going to read the whole chapter. Romans 6, 1 through 23. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through the baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Hear that term? Bondage, slaves. We're no longer in bondage to sin or slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. 
And this is what it means to, be, to die to your flesh. This is what Paul is speaking of. And he, he, he speaks of this many times through his writings. We are no longer our own. We're bought with the price. We read that earlier. We're no longer in bondage to sin. We have to die to our flesh, die to ourselves. We are now a new creation, no longer the old man, but the new man. So he who has died is now freed. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And that's our eternal hope. We will live with Jesus for eternity when we die to ourselves, receive him as our life. For it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And that's a complete submission. Now, there are some that will say, well, when you come to that point in understanding that, then you're sanctified. Well, I would disagree with that. I would say you're being sanctified because that's the beginning. That's the beginning, the knowledge that you are now a new creature, the knowledge that you are now born again, the knowledge that you are growing in Christ and the old man is dead and you're going to live with him forever. Having that knowledge is the process of being sanctified and then he begins to change you, begins to mold you, begins to shape you and take you where he wants you to be. And again, it's a, it's a lifelong process and you're continually growing when you're submitted to him. And we see here in verse 9 there, it says, Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So I reckon myself dead. Are you dead? Well, I reckon. You reckon yourself dead. In other words, you come to that point of believing this life is not acceptable to God. It's a fleshly life. I have to die to it. And now I'm, li I'm living because of he, uh, His life in me. And then verse 12 continues. It says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. And not, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. So we have a responsibility in this relationship. We have to be active in this relationship. So it says, do not let sin reign. We still, as humans, as in this fleshly tent, have a choice to make. We have to make a choice. Are we going to let this flesh be in control today, or are we going to let the Spirit of God? Are we going to submit to the Spirit of God? And it says, uh, let, uh, do not let it reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Do not present yourself as members of instruments of unrighteousness to sin. In other words, we have to avoid things that would pull us into this place. An alcoholic would has, has to avoid a bar. And there are some that think they're strong enough. I'm going to go in there and witness. I would recommend you not. Because chances are the spirits that are in there I'm going to bring more temptation to you than you can bear. And Jesus said he will not put on more than you can bear, but he'll make a way for you to escape. Well, don't go in to begin with. That's your escape. And so there's ways that we have to look at this. Don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. In other words, don't put yourself in positions of where the temptation is there that you already know. And believe me, in this world, Satan... He has little minions all over the place. They're watching you. They're watching. And they're setting up traps. They're setting up places. They know your weaknesses. They know, they know where you might wind up in trouble. And so they set these traps. And you can't drive down the highway and not be tempted by certain billboards. You can't go on the Internet for sure and not be tempted. There are things all over the place that are going to draw you toward your fleshly nature because it's by Satan's design to do so. And so all the marketing, all the advertising of any product out there today is designed for your flesh, not for your spirit. That's the way it is. So what do you do? You go hide in a cave somewhere? Well, there's an option, but it's not what God calls us to do. God doesn't want to alienate us to alienate ourselves away. He wants to let himself live through us in the midst of all of these things. 
And so therefore he prepares us by growing us as we're in his word, as we're in prayer, as we're in relationship. He, he teaches us how to present ourselves or our members as instruments of righteousness, not to sin. And it says, but present yourselves to God being alive from the dead and your members of instruments of righteousness to God. And verse 14 then says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. The grace of God. It's a, it's a free gift. But we have to receive it by coming to the point of conviction and repentance and then understanding that our old man must die. Verse 15, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So again, this is, this is black and white. It's, it's really that sharp of a line here. There's no gray area here. You either present yourselves as, as uh, living to Christ in obedience to Him, and you obey Him, or you submit to the fleshly nature, and you're obeying the law of sin and death. Verse 17 says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You're a new man. You no longer have the same God, little g. Now you have the big G. Now you have God Himself, the Father, who sent Jesus for our behalf to become back, in, uh, back children of God, as we've studied earlier, into that relationship with Him. Paul says, I have been, uh, having been set free from sin, you become slaves to righteousness. And then he goes on, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. We're to be holy because He is holy. But we in our flesh can't do that. In our being, we can't do that. So what does that mean? It means that the closer we are to Him in relationship, His holiness now becomes our holiness. His righteousness is now our righteousness. We can't achieve it on our own. We can never come to the point to say, I've arrived. I've accomplished it all. I'm now perfect in Christ. That statement alone brings you back into pride, which will pull you right back in to the law of sin and death because you can't ever come to that point. It's only Him in us and we need to abide in Him every moment of every day. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. What fruit do you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? And that's the thing again. Once conviction comes, shame comes. If, you're, if you fall into a sin and you're convicted, you're ashamed of what you've done. That goes all the way back to Adam. When they sinned, what did they do? They ran and hid. Why did they hit? Why did they hide? They were ashamed. They were naked and afraid. TV show. Don't watch it. But they were naked and afraid. And God comes to the garden walking and wants to be in fellowship like every day. But He knows. God knows what's going on with them. But He calls for Adam anyway. Adam, where are you? Adam. Where are you? Well, I'm right over here. He said, well, why are you hiding? Well, we're naked and ashamed. Well, who told you that you were naked and ashamed? Well, once they fell into sin, they fell out of relationship. They, the communion was broken. They knew it. God knew it. And so, therefore, God had to clothe them and hide them from their nakedness. So what we have now is we're looking at this. Uh, we present our members as slaves of righteousness and holiness. For when we're slaves of sin, you were freed in regard to righteousness. And what fruit do you have in the things of which you are now ashamed? So sin brings shame. There's no fruit there. And if it is, it's rotten fruit. 
It's not healthy fruit. It's not good fruit. It's bad fruit. And we don't want that fruit. We don't want that in our lives. For the end of these things is death, he goes on to say. That now having been set free from sin and having, and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. We now have good fruit. The fruit that leads to holiness. It's His Spirit that dwells within us. It's His Word that comes alive to us. This is who we are in Christ now. We're no longer bound under the law of sin and death, but we have holiness and everlasting life is promised here. And this is a verse that I think I remember growing up with, verses uh, 20, uh, Romans 3, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. There is no other place that sin can take you. If you live a lifestyle of sin and you've not been delivered by Jesus Christ into a relationship with Him, then your wages is death. That's the outcome. Again, it's very clear, very black and white. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a powerful chapter. It gives us a lot of insight when we're looking and hearing now in, in 1 John chapter 3. We're seeing and understanding, hey, what does it mean when it says that a believer cannot sin? It means that he is separated away from that, that lifestyle. Does it mean that he can't stumble? Does it mean that he can't fall? What it means is, is that he can be restored instantly with repentance and the change of heart, turning to 180, going back the opposite direction. This is what it means to be in Christ. Now, the closer we are to Him, and the more we allow the Holy Spirit to move in our lives, the more the, um, the Word comes to us before we fall into the sin. The conviction actually comes ahead of time. Or it may not be conviction, but it's just the, uh, the notification, I will say, the alarms going off. Hey, you're heading down the wrong path. Hey, this is not good for you. Hey, are you listening? And here's the thing. Jesus said it over and over again, and He spoke it even to the, to the letters in Revelation. He said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. If you have ears to hear, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. If you're so locked into the fleshly moment, you're not going to hear until afterwards. And then what happens? Satan throws out the guilt trip. You're ashamed. And the first thing that he, Satan's going to say is, oh, well, you blew it now. It's over. You can't go back. God doesn't want you anymore. You're too unclean. And you can say, no, that's not what the Word tells me. The Word tells me is that this sin that I just committed is not something that I need to live in. It is sin. I recognize it's sin. I recognize that I don't want that in my life. Forgive me, God, and restore me. And this, you go back to what, what David prayed. You know, in, in, in Psalm 51, you know, creating me a clean heart, create, creating me a pure heart. And that, and that may not be Psalm 51, but that's the one that came to my mind. When you, Psalm 51 was a, a prayer that he wrote in response to his sin with Bathsheba. And he went and he said, forgive me, forgive me, O God. And this is the attitude of the heart. A believer can slip into a sin but he cannot live there and still because, uh, because he's not abiding in Christ. He's now abiding in the flesh. And those two do not coexist. And this pretty much covers what John is saying this morning. And I want to leave you with this this morning. We're not perfected as of yet, but we're being perfected. We're not fully sanctified, but we're being sanctified. And don't let the enemy bring you into condemnation if you fall into a sin. But when it happens, repent. Repent. You're in this relationship with Jesus, and He's here for you. This, is, again, is the whole purpose of Him coming. Our flesh is still here. We're still in this tent. 
We still have finite minds. We still have the inability to understand the fullness of, of everything that God has for us. And we're still tempted every day. We still see things. We still hear things. We still act certain ways. And, and this goes back even to, even to uh, genetics in some cases and habitual learning from childhood up. You don't realize who you're turning into. And this is, this is what happens. And you get, when you see it, it's ugly. And you don't want to see it, so you fight it. And that makes it even uglier. But when, something's, when something hits you upside the head, and you know that God spoke it, then you've got to deal with it. And that's not an easy place. Because now... We have to come back and say, okay, this, this is how I've been. This is how I've been acting. This is how I've been doing. This is what's been going on. And God, I don't like it. I don't want it. But we still have to come to the point of repentance. And now he wants to work this out of you. And this may not, I'm not talking about a moral sin here specifically. It can be. But I'm talking about behavior. I'm talking about response. I'm talking about how you, how you deal with people and how things come out of your mouth and how it's perceived, and how it happened. These are all the things that, we want, that God wants to grow us out of. He wants to raise us up. And so now it's a process, and so we're having to see it, and we're having to say, ugh, if that's how I'm seen, I don't want to, I, it's ugly. So all of this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about the, the, the place to where sometimes God has to knock us upside the head so we can see things that we've been denying or have just kind of fallen into a pattern that we didn't even realize was there. But Jesus came for these purposes. He came because we can't do it within ourselves. Is my mic out? Oh, did I not ever put it up? Okay, well, can y'all hear me? I'm not going to pull it up now. I'm about done. <laughs> Thank, I kept seeing your hand signals there. I was thinking... I was thinking, say, yeah, you're talking to me. No. <laughs> I won't mention your name over the air. <laughs> yeah, I forgot to pull it up sitting back there. But when you're in a relationship with Jesus, he's here. The Spirit is here for us. Now, I hope that this gives us a deeper understanding on these verses that we've covered this morning. Because, again, when you casually read or you read over something, uh, Satan, he uses a word, to tw he twists the word to make you think it means something it doesn't mean. And if that's the case, you can read the words, oh, you can't sin, oh, well, then I'm done, because I know I just did. And he'll bring that false guilt against you. But in the, what we're seeing this morning, if we're born again, and we're in that relationship with God, we cannot live in that place of habitual sin. He will bring you to a place of a choice, of an understanding, and you have to make that choice to repent or to walk away. Now again, if there's anyone that may be unsettled on this point or this message this morning, I'm happy to sit down one-on-one -on -one and we can discuss it because I know a lot of times there's still a little guilt or maybe things about something we've done. That, you know, am I really forgiven? Did I really, you know... But here's the thing, if, if you're still struggling, if, if you have something that you're struggling with in your life and you are convicted about it, that's the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, he's winning you away from it, bringing you in to this relationship. James 5, verses 14 through 15, says, Anyone among you sick, let him call out for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. We're to seek those to pray for us. We're to confess with our mouth. See, if we confess with our mouth and, and repent in our heart, then we, we know that, that the Holy Spirit is working in us, and we are saved. We are in this relationship. We're no longer in the bondage of sin and death. But like I said, you can look at the church as a whole, the family of God, and you have division. Sometimes you have splits, you have, you have anger, you anger at your brother or sister, or likewise they're angry with you. And this whole 
aspect of what John writes in these particular epistles is all about loving one another. It's really, that's kind of the core that he's going to lead right back into when we get into the next message, which still, we've got to love one another. In order to love one another, we've got to love God first. Love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Submit unto Him. Once we're submitted to Him, then He begins to bring the change and gives us the ability to love our neighbors ourselves and the ability to love our brothers and sisters. It's not naturally within us to love everybody because we all have preconceived notions of how everybody else is supposed to be. And they have preconceived notions of how we're supposed to be. And until we die to those things and all of the expectations from one another and allow the Spirit of God then to dwell and say, okay, yeah, you have this expectation of your brother or sister. And let's put that on the shelf for a minute. Let's deal with you. Here's my expectation of you. Now, when we look at it that way, it doesn't look so pretty sometimes because we can't measure up in our flesh. So we submit. We acknowledge, we repent, we submit, and then we say, okay, God, I'm giving this to you. Change me. Change me. Don't worry about the other person anymore. I pray that they will seek the same thing. And, that you, and I do pray for them, Lord, if there are things in their life that, that, that are not right with you. I give that to you. May you work in their life. But, Lord, right now, change me. And this is a prayer that we can't ever move past because we're constantly going to be facing conflict in relationship. It's just that's because we're all born with a prideful, sinful nature. We've got to die to it. And He is bringing us to that place of dying. But like I said, you get through one. Praise God. Be ready for the next one. Because He's not done with us. He's molding us. And like the potter with the clay. He has to beat it down, get all those air bubbles out of it before He can mold it. And once He gets the air bubbles out of it, then He can shape it. And then what has to happen? He has to go into the fire to be refined, to be solidified. And that hurts. The bubbles he's beaten out of us are the sin bubbles. And then he puts us in the fire. And he continues to work with us. He continues to bring us to that place of reconciliation, total reconciliation, meaning that the flesh is dead and we're alive in Jesus. There will be that day. We'll have the new mind. We'll have a new body. We'll be in relationship with Jesus for eternity, we won't be dealing with the sinful nature any longer. But until that day comes, let's let the Word of God bring truth to our hearts and let us walk in that truth. Let us walk in that understanding and let us, let us not put ourselves in a mindset that we're, number one, unfixable. Number two, we're condemned because of a sin. No, we, we need to come to the place of understanding that Jesus paid for that on the cross. We just need to understand that we can't live there any longer and continue to ask God to take us to a new place and let that new man shine in this, in this area of our life. And again, it's, it's a continual relationship. He who has ears, ears to hear, let him hear because this is what God is speaking to us this morning. And there's no condemnation for the children of God. There's none. He loves us. He loves us. And He wants to bring us closer to Him. So, Father.